23. <clears throat> Psalm number 23. The offer still stands. I got to remind, I got to remind every single week because some people have bad short term memories. If you guys, if I have half of Sunday school memorized, be able to quote Psalm 23 by the end of this series, we are going to have breakfast. I will provide breakfast. Sunday school, the Sunday school hour will be one big smorgasbord of a breakfast that you all is not going to want to miss. Memorize Psalm 23, then we're going to have ourselves a time. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for all that you do. Lord, I thank you for being here with us, Lord. I know you're already among us, Lord. You're already here, Lord. This is your house, Lord. I ask, Lord, that you'll continue to have your presence here among us, with us, Lord. Help us to hear you, to recognize you, to feel you, Lord. Lord, I ask that you would forgive me of my sins, Lord, that you would fill, fill me with your spirit, Lord, that you would do something, Lord, in your service, in your house, Lord, this morning. Lord, I want to ask, Lord, that you, your spirit would accompany my voice and that you would speak to the heart of the hearer. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going through a, a little bit of a, you know, obviously Psalm 23, having a different view, a different observation, a little bit more detailed of a view, that of a shepherd, a shepherd's look, a shepherd's view of Psalm 23. I thought that was the funniest thing last week, that video. That How often is that us? It was a video last week, a short little clip. There was a little trench and a farmer went down because of one of the lambs got a sheep was inside of the uh, the ditch. He got in there, got all wet, get him out of that thing, pulled him out. He ran around one big circle, fell right back in the ditch. And how often is that with us and the Lord? The Lord delivers us. He gives us free. He allows us to be. He comes to set the captives free. The very thing that embondages us in sin. It is such easy so easy that once he delivers us we don't forget and just end right back in there all over again and that was that was funny only some made me laugh but we're going through this and looking at it and we come to the point he maketh me to lie down i didn't know this about sheep but apparently sheep they need Four different characteristics, four different qualities, four different things must take place for a sheep, for a lamb, a you. I don't know what the proper terminologies are, but for a sheep, for them to be comfortable enough to actually relax and to lay down. And we're going to hit those four qualities. You have to do this because if you don't, if you a shepherd is not going to get to the level where the sheep could respect them, where the sheep will love them, where the sheep will come to trust them. If they do not do that, they are going to be skittish. They're going to be squirming around. They're going to always be uh, on edge. They're going to be wandering around. They're going to be walking along the, uh, the fence lines. They're going to be looking for little tears or holes in the fence. They're going to start nudging around there. They're going to peek their head through. They're going to bust through that fence. They're going to lead the whole flock astray. And it's a nightmare. I don't know personally. That's just from what I read. But maybe one day the Lord will allow me to understand personally because I want to have a farm when I grow up. If you ask me what I want to be when I grow up, I want to be a farmer when I grow up. So 
Maybe one day the Lord will allow me to know that on a firsthand basis. But right now, that's just what I'm reading. It's just testimonies that I'm hearing from people that do own farms, that had owned sheep, that had owned cattle. Sometimes it could be a pain in the butt. And unfortunately, you can't look at it as a family pet. When you have a livestock of any, any, any kind, any likeness that is running astray, that is just a rebel to the very core of its being, that doesn't want to be used or broken down or uh, comply with how you want, unfortunately, <laughs> it has to become dinner. Because if it doesn't become dinner, it's going to affect and infect the rest of the flock and you are going to have yourself a mess to deal with so just like the bible says what do you do you smite the scorner you get the, the scorner you recognize what the problem is you publicly show that hey look this is wrong all y'all pay attention to this because this is bad we're going to correct it now you smite the scorner, and then the simple will beware. The simple will listen. And sheep, they are simple animals. They really, really are. Again, from testimonies that I hear, they are extremely simple animals. But yet, uh, they still need four. There's four qualities that they have to have and able to be rested enough, relaxed enough, comfortable enough that they will dare lay down. The Bible tells us, he maketh me to lie down. The Lord being our shepherd, us being the sheep, the relationship between the two, and seeing it on the outside view of a shepherd's view of these, uh, these sheep. One aspect is a sheep needs to. They need to, need to, need to be free from all fear. They need to be free from all fear. If they are, are, they are a terrified species, they are extremely anxious to the very core of their being. They are always spoofy. They're looking around. They think there's a wolf around every single rock. And you know what? It's good. To a certain point, that is good. To a certain point, you should be cautious. To a certain point, you should be aware of your surroundings and know what's going on and look to see if there is danger. But coming to the point where you are terrified, coming to the point where it paralyzes you, that is in a bad spot. That is, there's something wrong with that. You should keep a little bit of fear because it is what keeps you going. It is what keeps you protected. It is what keeps you safe. Obviously, outside of the realms of God, the safety is with the Lord. I understand that. But from a human speak, a human level have a little bit of fear, give a little bit of respect to whatever it is that's on the outside, and it will keep you on edge, and you will have your wits about you dealing with whatever it is. But coming to the point where that fear actually terrifies you, where that fear grips you, where you are just paralyzed and frozen, that is where we can't, we cannot, we cannot be at that point. That is a, 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 from Satan himself. If you are so anxious where you are frozen and paralyzed with fear. We don't want to do that. We need to learn how to cast all of our cares upon the Lord. Why? Because he careth for you. He cares for you. Yes, he cares for me. I know he cares for me. I know he cares for each one of us here. But do you realize how valuable you are to the Lord? You are valuable to the Lord. God loves you. You Now, don't just hear that word you and think that I'm speaking generally. Take it personally. Right now, you as an individual, God loves you. He cares for you. He said that I'm not going to leave you. He said I'm not going to forsake you. He said I'm going to take care of you. He said I will be your protector. He said I don't care what it is that you are afraid of on the outside because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You don't have to be terrified no more because God is your God. The Lord, the creator of the universe, is your God. You get saved. You have access to him. There is nothing too difficult, nothing too powerful, that he cannot be your protector and your deliverer. We just have to trust him. We have to trust him.
We should not be afraid of the world or the things that are in the world, but we need to have a healthy fear of God. We ought to have a healthy fear of God. We need to get back to that. The fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, be afraid. We ought to be afraid. Now, yes, there's multiple different definitions of that word fear, of that term fear. And yes, one of them does mean to reverence. And we also we ought to reverence God. We also we to know and to realize that He's He is the Lord of Lords and He is the King of Kings. We ought to recognize that. We ought to be give all level of respect and honor to Him because of that. But that is not all that you ought to do. The word fear, the definition is, is to be afraid. You ought to fear God. You ought to be afraid of his judgment because why? He chastens his own. He chastens his own. If you do wrong and you're a child of God, he is going to chasten you. God has a very big hand and he knows how to spank his children. He will reach his hand all the way down from the heaven of heavens to give his child a spanking if need be. And he knows, he knows how to get your attention. He knows how to make it hurt. He knows what he has to do to create something in your life to get your attention, to get you back on that straight and narrow path once again. You ought to fear God in a way where you are giving him reverence and giving him honor that is due unto his name. Absolutely, 100%. I don't think I'm, not, I'm trying to say anything otherwise. But an, in addition to that reverence ought to be a, a very, very pure, clean fear of his judgment because he does. He does. If you can do wrong and God doesn't chasten you, you need to check in, in with your salvation. You got to, because he said that he's going to chase him his own. And if you can do wrong and you at the very, 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 very least don't feel conviction. Well, Bible says examine yourself, whether it be in the faith. Bible says to prove your own self. And if you are doing wrong. Publicly or privately, I'm not it doesn't I'm not saying you have to be like the town drunk or nothing like that. But if you are doing wrong and God does not speak to your heart in some way, shape or form, you need to check up on Zom. Uh, you need to check. I'm just giving you that warning because I know what the Bible says. And if you are, are doing something and experiencing something that God says that he's going to do to his very own children, to the very dear elect from those that are saved, that are born again, that are clearly his kids and you are not feeling that chastisement, you need to check in. Check in on, on that. So that is one aspect of a sheep, of a lamb, a you, whatever it is. That species that is there, if you want them to lay down, if you want to be a shepherd, if you want to own sheep one day, what you have to do is you have to get to them, get to the uh, have a herd, create that herd mentality of each one and allow them to know that you are their protector, that you are going to protect them and they have no need of fear at all. And you will be the one that they completely trust. Uh, and we're, we're doing good. We are doing good. We are going to have them sheep laying down in no time. We're going to be able to be comforted and have that confidence, that unshakable confidence in God that we, if we keep these steps up. And if you learn how to fear God the way you ought to fear God and not be afraid of that, those things that you're on without, the worldly things, the worldly aspects, and you give your terrors to the Lord, He's going to be able to do something, and he will do something with you. He definitely will. One thing besides that fear, getting away from that fear, being in that realm, you also, there has to, has to, has to be a freedom from friction. When I say that, I mean amongst each other. In that fold, in that sheep fold, the shepherd has to constantly be on the lookout to see if there is a, a, a one female or one male, if there's a, a one little kid that's acting up, that's getting out of line, that's approaching another one, that's being, that's taunting another one, that's messing around. That's because again, they get they're very, very 
skittish. They're they scared. They fear. They they buckle very easily. And if there is friction within the crowd, it is not going to jive. It's not going to come together. You are going to have yourselves a very difficult, difficult, difficult issue. A very difficult time leading them because there's pockets everywhere. There's fighting. You're trying to lead, and then next thing you know, these guys are following up. These guys aren't. They're getting the attention of those ones. You're wandering all around, and you're going to have yourselves a difficult, difficult time. Again, you got to find smite the scorner, and the simple will beware. If you are looking like you're supposed to, and you're looking out, and you're being watchful, and you're recognizing, hey, wait a minute, it seems like there's a little problem here. I need to stop this before it becomes a schism, before it has a division, before there's a big major problem on our hands. You find the people that there is or that you have issues with and fix it. Fix it, fix it, fix it. There's a thing. Where is it? Hmm. It's in it's in one of the Gospels. I forget. I forget where shame on me. I should know a good chapter and verse of what I'm talking about if I'm going to be up here to present it. But God says, hey, look, you're coming to the altar. You're doing good. You're doing great. I want you to come to the altar. He said, hey, look, you got to get up here. This is where we make decisions. And that's why I love altar calls so much because you're striking when the iron is hot. When the preacher is preaching, the evangelist, the missionary, when the, the man of God is up up here if there's a women's conference and the lady is up here and that she's teaching her heart out that very moment when God is speaking to your heart God wants instant uh, instant response instant obedience he wants you to respond instantly and that's what we ought to do you're coming up here God said hey look you're moving up to the altar you're doing good you're doing real good but hold, hold on time out time out Leave that thing right there. Whatever it is that you want, that gift that you want from me, that promise that you need, that, that, that freedom, that deliverance that you're looking for, that answered prayer that you so desperately need, you leave that thing right there. Remember, you got a problem with brother so-and-so. You got a problem with sister, what's her name? <laughs> you need to fix that thing. You need to get that thing right. Now, it's not your responsibility for the other person to receive anything. You don't have to be, you're not on the hook on what their reaction and what their response is. But what you are on the hook for is having that initial act that you're trying to make peace, trying to have that peace, trying to extend that olive branch, trying to make wrong uh, or make right a wrong that had happened. You are responsible for trying. You're not responsible on how the other person reacts or responds, but you are responsible for trying. You need to leave your gift at the altar. Go find your brother. Go find your sister. Go find that person you have all against. Make it right and then come back. God even said it. He tells us, hey, look, I need peace among the brethren. One of the things that was uh, was evident on the day of Pentecost, the Bible tells us there was 120, there was more than 120, but there was 120 for argument's sake that was of one accord. They, there was no division among them. There was no bickering. There was no murmuring. They were all together in one heart and in one mind. And if we're going to do something for the cause of Christ, we got to come to that conclusion also. We need to lay our differences aside. Let's knock it off with the murmurings. Who cares if you like it or if you don't like it? This whole entire thing is a little bit bigger than just you. Nobody wants to hear your negative comments, your groans, and your mumbles, and your complaints. Stop with the gossip. Stop with the murmurs. And if there is a problem, go to that person that you have a problem with and fix it before it be gets out of hand, before it becomes a schism, before there's a church split and divide because of it. We have to, have to, have to, have to. You want to be at that place where you could truly, truly rest in the Lord, where you could be like that sheep that he maketh to lie down. You have to get away with the, the, the fractions, with the divisions, with the strife. We have to get away with being at odds with each other. We have to be free from the friction. We have to be free from fear. There's another thing we need to be free of. If you want to see in a pasture a flock of sheep laying down, yes, those two aspects have to be there, but there's another one too. They have to be free from flies and pestilences and parasites. They have to, have to, have to be free. Be free. Hold on, I'm checking.
Be free from pestilences. Be free from parasites. Be free from the flies. And one aspect I see, uh, see this, what can it be? It could be a distraction. A lot of times when I'm on a farm or I'm on vacation, I go see here or there, see livestock. I see sometimes, sometimes flies all over the place, getting in their noses, getting in their eyes. They're just, you just see them twitching their ears, trying to get some free, flipping their tail around, rubbing their, fa their, their faces on the fence posts. They're trying to get a sense of relief. They're trying to get away from the distraction that is there. You know how annoying it must be. The pastor said the, the other week, he said, did anybody else see the fly that was in the sanctuary? And I'm thinking, that's just one fly, and he's getting so distracted. Imagine if he had 150 flies just swinging all around the place. There would be a little bit of an annoyance there. There would be a, little, a major distraction there. I don't even know if he would be able to focus on anything else if 150 flies just comes right at him and swarming all around him. He would be, that would be kind of funny, but anyway... <laughs> But he would be very distracted, and that's what we, we got to recognize distractions. When we know, when we get something from the Lord, when God has given us uh, something, and he, even more importantly, when he doesn't speak to you, when he's not very clear, how much more important it is. I say that because we know what the general will of God is. Everybody knows what the general will of God is. You have a Bible, you know what the general will of God for everybody, individ every individual here, that you know what it is. You have it in Scripture. But you don't necessarily know what God's specific will is. If you, that is a little bit more specific to each individual personally. What does God have for you? Why is it that you are here? What did God create you for? You fit into the body of Christ in this local location right here to give something to it. What is that thing? That is a specific will for, of God in your life. A very personal calling. So there's the, a couple different aspects of it. If you know what it is that you're, or if you don't know what your specific will is, just keep on doing what you know is right. You got God's general will. You know that you're supposed to be in church. You know that you're supposed to be reading the Bible. You know you're supposed to be praying. You know that you're supposed to be living clean to the best of your ability. You know when you sin that you're supposed to repent of your sin. Bring it to God and keep that a short sin list there. You know there's some things that you know that you're supposed to do and that you just keep on doing it and you keep on doing it and keep on doing it because you know it's right and eventually God is going to reveal his specific will for you. But he, the devil is going to try to distract you. He's going to try to distract you. He's going to try to put people in your way to slow you down. He's going to try to cause a situation and a scenario to put hooks inside of you, to get, allow you to be uh, un uncertain, to allow there to be question marks, to allow you to hesitate. He's going to try to d distract you of every single way possible that he can. You can't do it. You know the direction God has you in. Just go one step at a time. Go forward. Go forward. Go forward. The devil is going to create distractions. He is a master of it. Don't pay no mind to those. That's one of the major things that I, I hate about these phones, about smartphones. Because of the technology, especially with social media, whatever avenue, whatever platform you want to use, I'm not even talking about sinful things. And if it's all flat out sinful, well, shame on you in the first place. Yeah, I ought not to even have one if you have a problem with that. But I'm talking about the things that aren't even really necessarily sinful. It's just time wasters. They distract you from what's really important. They suck the life out of you. And that's another thing that the parasites do they suck the life out of you they bleed you dry and that is what satan is trying to do he's trying to get you so distracted so many irons in the fire that you are ineffective at everything that you do because you're doing too much and it amounts for nothing and the, all your efforts in vain because you are running on fumes that you don't even uh, you, you can't even recognize god's voice with your own voice because your thoughts are fine a minute a mile a minute you're hearing other people's counsel 
so you're taking in everything from every. That's why I opened up in the beginning about the sensitivity to the Lord. Because when things are good, when you're in the mountaintops and you have that experience with God, it's very easy and very clear. You know what God is saying. But when you're in that valley, sometimes you have a thousand different directions that you possibly can go. You hear God uh, or you know what God said, but then you hear different voices pulling you this way, pulling you that way. It seems this opportunity is here and that opportunity comes and you don't know which way to go. And every uh, every outcome seems to be a good outcome. The devil is trying to cause confusion. He's trying to stir up inside of your mind uh, a, a direction other than the one that you ought to be chasing just stay with the stuff know what you are doing know God's voice specifically what he has for you and just keep on going and keep on going and keep on going one of the things you have, we have they have to be free of flies and then I, I thought one of the names of Satan is, is Beelzebub and what is I think that is the Lord of the flies I think that's what it is Satan himself that whatever reminder, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We don't. Yes, people can be annoying. People can be very annoying. But you have to come to the point, if you believe that this physical world is the outward manifestation of the spiritual realm and realize that people, for a lack of better terms, are like puppets, we don't know what's going on. We don't know the, the spiritual in the spiritual realm what is influencing us and what is prompting us and what is going on. The devil is an opportunist and he is going to set the stage and create things to happen to rip your heart away from the Lord, to get you busy, to get you caught up with something else, to distract you, to lead you astray. He's going to try. He is going to try. When you can't do it on your own, you can't do it on your own. It's not a physical battle. It's not like the Olympics. It's not a wrestling match. It's not a, 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 a UFC fight. It, this is not a fight that you can do with your own skill, with your own ability, with your own strength. You need, need, need the strength of the Lord. It, it's the Lord of the flies that you are fighting against, the king of of this world, the God of this world. He is a foe that is more powerful than you can possibly even imagine, and you are nothing for him or to him. You can't do this in your own strength. You need to be ready to fight. And how is it that a child of God is ready to fight? Well, you ought to do a study. Pastor went through it recently. If that wasn't good enough, do another study on Ephesians chapter 6, the armor of God. I will tell you to read from verses 10 all the way down to verse 20. Read it all. Study it your own self. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness and rulers of the... It's bad, but we got to have our targets. Or our targets ought to be the right ones, the guns pointed in the right spot. It's not your it's not your wife. That's not the problem. The husband is not the problem. Your boyfriends and girlfriends, that is not the issue. Children and parents is not the problem. It is the behind the scenes. It is Satan stirring up trouble. That old slew foot, good for nothing, good for dirty, rotten old snake that he is, that dragon, he's behind the scenes. He's the one that's trying to sow discord among the brethren. He's the one that's trying to get us to turn our, our, our attention away from each other and pull our hearts away from each other. God wants unity. He wants our hearts knit together in love. And Satan wants us to be divided. And he's going to try everything, everything in his power. One thing that I notice, at least for me personally, God tells us, he warns us that Satan has access to heaven right now. And the Bible tells us that he is the accuser of the brethren. The Bible tells us that he does go and try to create a case against us. That's what the Bible tells us. So if he is the accuser of the brethren, this is just to be safe. If you hear anything about brothers and so-and-so or sister, what's her name, anything at all, just 
assume that there's some kind of misunderstanding, something that, no, that you're not understanding it right. You're not receiving the way it's supposed to. You didn't clearly hear the, the explanation. There's something because most of the time, most, I would say upwards, even over 90% of the time, uh, argument or disagreement is either one, I didn't relate to you what I was trying to, the, the message I was trying to give. I didn't relate to you properly where you properly understand where I'm coming from. Or the other way around, the person that's listening didn't receive it the way that it was attended to. They thought something else. They thought this thing was uh, in the way. They thought this was the reason why. Satan is good at what he does. I'm not saying he's good. He's not good. He's wicked. He is no good. But what he does, he does well. He is a master, a master in psychology that he had over 6,000 years to study the human mind. He knows what it takes to get us to move, to get us to respond, to get us to tick. He knows how to operate uh, the natural realm as well as the spiritual realm. And you're not going to, you are not going to do it on your own. How else do we do this, how to fight this battle? Yes, we need to get strapped up in the armor of the Lord, but we need to be filled with the Spirit. You need to be filled with the Spirit. I'm not talking about being indwelt with the Spirit. You get indwelt with the Spirit the moment you get saved. You get baptized in the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit of God indwells you. You are sealed unto the day of redemption. I'm not talking about being indwelt with the Spirit. I'm saying if you want to be successful as a child of God, that you are actively being a soldier for the cause of Christ, you are doing something, you're going to have to be filled with the Spirit of God. That's not you getting more of the Spirit, but that is the Spirit getting more of you. You need to learn how to pray. You need to learn how to get a hold of the Bible, get in the Bible discover biblical truths, how to apply them. You need to hear that still small voice of God. You need to, need to, need to. And lastly, you have to be, there has to be a free, a free of hunger, a freedom of hunger. If the sheep are hungry, they are going to be looking. They're going to be all going to walk on around the place. They're going to be looking on the other side of the fence. They're going to think that what is on the other side, the grass is greener on the other side. They're going to be distracted like uh, never before. Sometimes that even affects people. You heard of that, that, that term called being hangry? Yeah, you get hungry enough. Any individual gets hungry enough. Some people, not any, I don't want to say any, but some people allow that sense of hunger, that feeling, that, that, uh, that uh, well, I don't know how else to describe it, but that hunger that you feel in your stomach, they allow it to do something in their mind. They allow it to trigger something in their brain, and it affects them negatively. They become a negative Nelly. They start uh, cussing all kinds of cusses without really cussing because it's that Christian curse words, you know, that. but it really means the same thing. You're expressing the same exact thing, but you just, you know, you know, patch it up, make it look a little bit more friendly, put a little smile on it, and it's okay. But you do that. You, you got, you, we have to come to the point I'm getting distracted. We need three, four things. Time's up, ready to go, and I got to end this thing now. You, you have to be free of hunger. You have to know that the shepherd is going to feed you. It, yes, God tells us, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We need to take in the Bible, take in mega doses of scripture. We have to allow the spiritual man to be fed before the physical man is fed. We need to rely on the Bible, rely on God, rely on him completely. If you have those four aspects of fear, a freedom of hunger, a freedom of flies and parasites, a freedom of that friction, a freedom of fear, you are going to see out in the, in the hills a pasture of sheep, a flock of sheep that is able to be calm and able to be settled and able to be comforted that is able to jive together and actually lay him down and that will be a testimony a public testimony of the effort and energy of that shepherd of the love that he pours into that flock by the way they are, are, are represented of him by laying in those fields and together all of us it will do us good 
if we applied those things too, if we came to the point where we are not going to be skittish anymore and allow the shadows at night to scare us, to paralyze us with fear, that we are going to cast our cares on the Lord, that we are going to come to the grip in terms of fearing the Lord and how to fear Him, and that we are going to fear Him, that we are going to do our part to make sure that there is no friction in the crowd, in the church house, uh, in, in our community wherever we are as individuals. We are going to remember that this battle is a spiritual battle, that our enemy is a spiritual enemy. This natural world, yes, at times seems to rise up against us, but when they do that, it's not because they had it in their thought process to do whatever. It's that Satan is behind the scenes. We need to put our guns on the right targets there. We have to know what what is a time waster and what is a distraction and that we that is going to take us away from the Lord and we have to have to have to I know it's a fifth Sunday fellowship there's going to be plenty of food but we can't just survive on physical food think of this every time that you eat every single time that you eat anything you consume something think of this is my spiritual man being fed as much as my natural man is? Did I feel the, feed the spiritual man first today? That's what we ought to do. We ought to be chasing after and ensuring that spiritual man is strong and then feed the natural that we could go on whatever it is that God got for us to do. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for all that you do, Lord, for the mercy and the grace that you give us, Lord, for the allowing us to be able to be here in your house, Lord, for this look, Lord, of the, the shepherd's perspective, Lord, of Psalm 23, Lord, to have a slightly different angle, a little bit more of an intimate understanding, Lord, of what your word has to say. And Lord, I ask that you'll continue to guide us, protect us, and bless us, Lord. Continue, Lord, be with Pastor, fill them with your spirit, Lord. Lord, I ask that you'll guide the people here, Lord, that you'll bring them out, Lord, that you'll do something great here in your house today. We give you the glory, honor, and praise of all said and done in Jesus' name, amen.
Well, good morning. Glad to see everyone here with us this morning. Good rumble of the name. If you're going to stay with me, we'll sing number 222, Saved by the Blood. than the people that are saved. Um, it's okay. It is. I see her up here. She's got both hands going. I know some of you would fall out and have a heart attack if you had to do that, but it is okay. I don't mind a hand raised, two hands raised. Some of you were so unsaved when you got saved, you should be jumping up and down and both hands. Uh, and that's probably what I'll do on the next verse. Uh, but it's okay to show a little emotion. Don't let the ones who aren't even saved yet outdo it. Uh, even if it's just a smile on their face, that would help. Join me on verse 3. times I have sung that song in my life. The truth, the simplistic truth of the salvation for every single one of us. My sins are all pardoned. My guilt is all gone. How many people are still shackled by guilt and shame when we don't have to be? There may be times in here where we don't want to sing out loud because like, I don't feel like raising my hands to God. I, I feel like it's, I'm singing these songs, but they may not apply to me. That's not true. Are we saved? Yes, this song applies. You can get excited 
about every single song we sing because this is the truth available for every single Christian in Christ, no matter who you are. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this day, Lord. I thank you for the salvation that you give to every single one of us, Lord. The joy that can come overflowing from our lives just by being your children, by being uh, free from our sin and our guilt, Lord. That is what you promise. That is what you demonstrate, Lord. And we know you have the power to do that. I just thank you so much for your salvation by your blood, Lord. I just pray that you would uh, be with us today, Lord, as we have a day of fellowship and a day uh, of your word. I just pray that we would be uh, fully engaged in the preaching today, Lord, that we would uh, see what you have for us, Lord, to get excited about your word and the truth that is about to be given to us today that could possibly change the rest of our lives and the outlook that we have on life. I pray that you would help us focus today and be with us now as we come and continue to sing praises about you, Lord, and to you. I pray on every single heart here to be uh, joyful in singing. I pray in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Number 224, he keeps me singing. <laughs> across the broken string, stirred the slumbering chords again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Feasting on the riches of his grace, beneath the sheltering on his smiling face that is why i shout and sing jesus 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 sweetest name i know fills my every longing keeps me singing as i go though sometimes he leads Some announcements for you today. Some of them are repeat. One of them I think is new. Uh, but just a reminder jo- the uh, VBS is going to be July 17th to the 21st. Theme is Stompers and Chompers, Dinosaurs, sty- dino- Dinosaurs. I went to bed at 2 a.m. last night. I was a little tired. No. It was my own doing, though. I cannot say anyone else is, is my fault. Um, I know. All right. So, Stompers and Chompers, July 17th to the 21st. Um, that is going to be our theme. We're still looking for decor and crafts for that. If you're interested in helping, uh, there's plenty of things that I uh, need help with, uh, whether helping Mr. Jeff with games or even helping kids sit during class. Um, any of those, uh, we have plenty of positions available for help uh, for VBS. Uh, so keep it on your calendars for July 17th to the 21st and hopefully be available for that. Uh, fifth Sunday Fellowship today uh, after the morning service. We're going to try and as quickly as we can break down the tables or break down the chairs, set up tables. Um, set up the food. We will make a request. A lot is going on in here. 
uh, to put food together and have it all set up. So we request that if you are going to stay but kind of hang around, uh, it be in here, either helping set up or just talking, whichever, but just trying to steer clear of the people working in there. If you have to go to the bathroom, you can just sneakily along the outside or go out. Uh, just try and stay out of their way as best as possible so uh, we have everything set up and be ready to go for that. Um, yeah. Ladies' Conference at Brigantine Bible Church, May 6th at 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, Brigantine Bible Church is obviously in Brigantine, New Jersey. Uh, the pastor there is Jimmy Powderly, a good friend of ours. And uh, they're going to be hosting their ladies' thing. I know the men had their little weekend. It was wonderful, fantastic. Uh, so that will be for the ladies on May 6th. Uh, if you have any questions, send us a bell. I'm not sure if the registration is up yet. Oh, you don't have to register. Oh, they're just going to have plenty of food for you. Great. Uh, so you don't have to register. A uh, group of ladies are going, and you want to go together, uh, please see me or Miss Bell, and we'll get that coordinated. Now she's speaking in tongues. Look at that. Um, so if if anyone has looked at our calendar, which I have not even looked at our calendar a lot, um, but we do have a calendar. It's a beautiful calendar. It has uh, the idea for how we want the year to go as far as events and such. Um, on the calendar, it says we're supposed to have a ladies' tea party pretty soon. Uh, that has to be postponed for a little while. We're not sure when it's going to be happening. Um, in case you were paying attention to that, uh, the date is TBD. Uh, so just to keep that in mind to let you know. Uh, Memorial Day picnic would be Monday, May. It is not the 39th. It's not the 39th. The 29th. If, listen, if anyone gets to May 39th, whew. I'm going to say that. No. <laughs> I just need to steal some of my wife's coffee. She got coffee. I'm not doing that. Uh, but anyway, Memorial Day picnic, May Monday, May 29th. 29th. Um, it's going to be at uh, Mr. Chuck's house, which is also my husband's house. Um, if you haven't been there before, we can get you the address uh, before that date. Um, but it's a wonderful time for us to come together. We'll get more information as far as starting time. There is really no ending time, but we do turn off the lights at some point. Um, so <laughs> we'll see how that is. You can stay out fishing all night if you want. Mr. Chuck might be there with you. But, <laughs> um, but it's a wonderful time. We love it every single year. So just keep that on your calendars for that date. If you can, please bring a dish to share just so there's plenty for everyone. We don't run out of food and drink. <laughs> that just happened in the background. I don't know why. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, Memorial Day picnic, uh, May 29th. And then um, this is going to be the final day to sign up for the team camp uh, this year. We're going to the Wilds of New England. The dates for that were June 26th uh, to July 1st. Um, it, this is like the final. If you do not speak to me today, um, we're going to assume that you are not going. Um, but please, if you know you definitely aren't going, please come see me and let me know so I don't have to go chasing after people because um, I forget to chase after people. Um, but if you can please, uh, parents, teens, come see me uh, with your answer for that, and then we can finish up registration for that uh, to know who all will be going. All right, thank you for sitting through me and the announcements. If you'll stand with me, we're going to sing number 292. It's just like his great love. Holding my dear. 
Jesus to roll the clouds away. It's just like Jesus to keep me day by day. It's just like Jesus all along the way. It's just like his great love. When sorrows clouds overtake me and break upon my head. When life seems worse. Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this day, Lord. I thank you for the songs we've been able to sing, just reflecting on you, Lord, and just your goodness to us, the salvation you bring from your blood, Lord, and um, how you and all the grace you give us to keep us singing no matter what circumstance, Lord. And then just, just now reflecting on how great your love is for us, Lord, how we could sing forever of you and your love. There's no exhausting of your love. It's endless. It's unbounded. It's all about us. No one can match it. We are what you say you love us the most. And so the just the wonderful time together as we listen to your word, Lord, through the pastors, the preachers, and the hymns, the songs, and uh, and the Holy Spirit. I pray we this offering as well as we give it so that every heart can be cheerful in giving. Um, use it to help us as cornerstone, reach our community, and more importantly, reach souls for Jesus Christ. We just offer Jesus' name for the glory. see so many people here. We have some visitors. I think I heard that I wasn't the only one. I had some that had thought to come. I know my sister doesn't live that far away. She was telling me about to go down next week. So I think I have another last night to come check out. But if you've never met my sister, God bless you to this point. Um, Today you're like, it's over. No, I'm just kidding. really great people, and sacrificed their time for me, so I'm glad that I'm here. Come on, y'all.
all say it about Shay. And so, uh, and, and Scott, who's not as much of a man as he used to be, uh, they're putting him back together slowly. Uh, he came just to make me feel like a sissy. Uh, almost severed his finger with a skill saw. And I think that's the key word is skill. It's only his fingers. I don't know. Uh, but uh, keep praying for him that it heals properly and uh, that his uncle becomes a man one of those days. Uh, we'll find out more about that later on this week. But uh, <coughs> thankful for the McCullough family. And uh, Sonny, uh, what, is, what is an elder? What is a pastor? I've pastored here 17 years. I'm going to go the rest of 23. I think we saw each other maybe ten times in all those years, uh, and it was because you didn't want me to do things for your children. So I think we just kind of tried to wait, and once they get to that age where they can handle a lot of things, or whatever, then uh, I think it was a little wise to just go that way. Uh, but just a blessing to have been over the years, and uh, always encouraging, uh, and good to have known. Not one of those pastors that I, when I get around them, I just want to. has opened doors where they've just gone into mission and I'm excited to be a part of that give where we can and uh, go ahead and do so much as we can the eyes Jesus Christ Christ uh, I saw panic fear anger downright wrath I don't like to put any pressure on them. If their dad puts pressure on them, that's fine. Uh, mom puts pressure on them. Let's do whatever. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and do the Lord's work and let it happen. Uh, oops. Sorry. I didn't, I didn't wear my jacket. I know I did. He said he didn't wear his jacket, and I said, well, I don't mind taking mine off. That doesn't bother me at all. So, uh, all right. Well, thank you very much for allowing us to be here. Thank you for uh, the church just welcoming us uh, in here. It's been a joy uh, to be here and to have our family coming. And, and it has been a lot of years that we've been in this area. And as your pastor said, I've just, uh, we've stayed busy. I know your pastor stayed busy here and we've stayed busy over there. And, and then God just began to open doors and uh, I don't know why he didn't open them. I said, God, why didn't you open these doors 20 years ago rather than have me stay somewhere pastoring for 20 years-ish and, and then ship us somewhere else? And it's just, but God has his reasonings. God has his way. And uh, I do see why some of the reasons of what he did or what he, why he did what he did. And, you know, we know that all things work together for his good. And we don't always understand it at the time, but here we are. Uh, no, really, I mean, seriously, you know, we go into uh, a lot of third world type settings and um, going into those areas, of course, a lot into Africa, a lot of uh, um, third world areas in Africa. And people always ask me when they say Africa, immediately people think of, you know, lions, tigers and, you know, elephants and giraffes and all of that. No, none of those places are where we go. Um, those are the nice places in Africa. I mean, serious, really. The, the real nice places in Africa have animals. Stop and think about it for a minute. If you're super hungry, are you going to allow a giraffe live to live? Seriously. I'm, ser I'm dead serious. So Kenya, South Africa, Tanzania, places like that. Not the real, real tough areas. They all have those real nice Zambia, they have those nice safari places, and you can see all the animals. Um, the, the third, the real rough areas, the, there are no animals. There, there are none. There are none. If you see a snake, any kind of a snake, just say, oh, there's a snake. Boom, it's dead. All you got to do is say, there it is, and it's gone, because they're going to eat it. They're, they're not going to, they eat rats, they, anything they can find. 
anything they can find. You're lucky to ever see even birds hardly fly in the sky because they just eat everything. And you don't blame them, obviously. Um, but anyway, I do appreciate you as a church getting on board. I want to show you some of the things that you all are doing. And I want to challenge um, you to can just continue to do more. So we just were in uh, Sierra Leone, Africa, just, I, I say five weeks. I think it's been more than that now. Six or seven, six, seven weeks ago, we were just in Sierra Leone. And um, I want to give you a little bit of an update on that and give you an update on how things went with the national pastors. We went there mainly for our um, marriage conference, bringing in all the national pastors. Did I mess this up? For a marriage conference, it's working? All right. Um, so we mainly were there for that purpose. But um, obviously we did other things. We reached into some new villages, working with some national pastors. So I want you to see kind of a little bit of an update here. So we'll go ahead and show that short video clip there. One of the church buildings, very typical, very normal construction of the church. It's the first time that pastor and his wife have ever been out of the country. Average life for an adult male in Sierra Leone is, I think, 46. Lots of children that are orphaned. And when they're orphaned, they just live in the trees. They live in the woods. There's no orphanages. There's no such thing. Overseers Church, Pastor Solomon. This church was built in the 1800s. This is our marriage conference. Of course, there's no hotels, so we just take pup tents, and each married couple just gets the tent. They think it's the greatest thing in the world. They've never stayed in a tent, most of them, ever. Our national overseer for Mission Uttermost, Pastor Van Boy. Renew their wedding vows during the marriage conference. Pastor King and his wife. Pastor Alex. They're raised, most of them are raised Muslim. So to kiss in public, to touch, to hold hands, all that's a no-go. Never do you ever do that. Obviously.
got into 11 schools. We teach, preach, open. The simplest things like glow sticks. They've never experienced them before. They love it. started six churches in the last 10 years and he's married two children. So that was just a quick update. I'll have, um, we have some other pictures too. I want to give you an update on the, you guys support a bunch of uh, college students. And so I want to give you just an update. We just had a graduation in Congo trying to get there and I just was unable to get there because we just got back. We're leaving on Friday for South America, Peru, and Quito, so we're not going to be around long here, but then um, I'm hoping to get to Congo by July, the end of June, July. Uh, but here's some of the college students in Congo just finishing up, graduating. Um, you can skim through these. I don't think there's too many of them, but these folks, um, many of you all are helping $35 a month to support them roughly. And that's, they're going through Bible college. They do a three-year course, and then they're ready to go out and start a church. And many of them are already started churches in different villages with gatherings of converts and then discipleship. And they just don't have a building. They, they just usually use bamboo and put up like tarps and things around, and then that's where they would start. And then uh, that's one reason why I have to get back over there to Congo because uh, last year there were five graduates, this year uh, there were seven graduates, and um, now they'll have 50, 60, 70 people gathering in these village, different villages that they go to, not all the same, they all go to a different village. It would be similar to like us being assigned like a bus route area, if, if you know that term, um, and they go to the village, wherever it may be, they ride a bike, ride a motorbike, they spend Friday, Saturday, Sunday there, and then they come back for Bible college again on Monday. So they're working all their weekends, and they're winning people to Christ, discipleship and training and teaching, and they're building a, a church, if you want to call it that, a gathering of believers. That's what it was. That's what a church is, right, in the New Testament, is a gathering of believers, and they're gathering those people. They disciple, they teach, they train, and then when they graduate, then now the next step is, okay, now are we going to build a building for them? And so that's their next step. They already have the gathering of people. They already have the church, if we want to call it that, because that's what this, the people. But um, then we go over and we look around. We see we see what property. Usually they already have property either purchased or uh, gotten given to them by the chief. And then it's the process of can we build them a building. And usually the buildings cost around twenty-five to $3,500 roughly to build the building. You saw the church building. It's not anything astronomical, but that's normal. That's their standard living of con living conditions. So they're fine with that. And so we build a church building for roughly $2,500, $3,500. So those, now those seven graduates are waiting for me to get there so that I can look at their, uh, their work, give it a report, and then possibly start working into helping build them a building. We never do it all at one time. We usually give them three to $500 at a time. You show progress, then we give you more, and obviously that's how it works until the building's complete. So um, just giving you a little bit of a snapshot because I know you guys are very invested with the college students. We're leaving for South America. You guys are also supporting a bunch of college students in Peru, and we'll be seeing those, those folks here this coming week. Um, by next weekend, we'll actually be with them. Uh, this time we'll be with them uh, there in uh, Peru. So thank you very, very much, really, for your support, for everything that you're doing. 110%, 100%, and I say 110%, but uh, that's because we also invest heavily into these works as well. Um, but I say 100% of all of what you all give is going into these national pastors and going into starting churches. So it's a joy. Again, you know, I pastored for, is that the last pictures or were those there more? Is there three more? That's it. Okay. All right. Then that's fine. We can be good then. And um, I will go ahead and have the kids 
go ahead and come on up here because they're going to go ahead and sing. We're, we, when we go, it's not, um, it's not anything high tech. We're singing some scripture songs. I want you guys to kind of be challenged by this, and maybe some of them will stick in your mind. We started doing this, uh, I'd say maybe three or, three or four years ago, heavily, we started learning scripture, learning scripture by song and putting so- scriptures to music and other people and taking them. Because if you're like us, you know, we're told to hide God's word in our heart, aren't we? We're told to hide God's word in our heart, but oftentimes we don't do the best of jobs at memorizing, right? The Bible just calls it meditation or meditate on his word. We don't do the best of job at that, but, and we do. We, all of us probably have scripture that we have that we've memorized, but at the same time, we don't have a lot of it. And so we started doing this, and just in the years that we've started doing this with our kids, I think we figured it out, the two to 300 scripture verses now that we know because we know it to song. And so then it comes to us when we need it. And oftentimes when we're traveling, there are a lot of times when we need comfort, we need help, we need strength. Uh, you know, when you're just overwhelmed with the work and the job that, that we have still yet to do for Christ, that he commanded us to do, but we still have yet to do it. And it's, it, it oftentimes just gets overwhelming. And, and the satanic attacks, honestly, you know, we are blessed here in America. We, um, we never, I, I don't know if we've ever gone more than a five to seven day period without seeing satanic involvement, satanic um, indwelling in people, in children even. One of the last ones that came to me last trip was, a, I think it was about a six or seven year old little boy that was satanically just being driven and, and just, it's very common to see in, in these places. And uh, so the best thing for us is to have God's word. And so anyway, let's, uh, we're just going to sing some. If you want to sing along with us, if you know them, great. If you uh, want to look up the words, you should have the words right in front of you. All right. So I'll give you the reference and then we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll go with it. Second Timothy chapter number one and verse number seven, second Timothy one and verse number seven, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind, right? We uh, do go into crazy situations. We go into very odd, and what most people say, I'd never do that. We don't do things foolishly. The Bible doesn't say to be foolish, but it does say that we can do it, and we have been given the power to be able to do it through the working of the Holy Spirit. So let's go uh, 2 Timothy 1, 7, right? John 4.35, say not ye there yet four months. This was a challenge last year uh, for the church and for us as a family, but, you know, the scripture Jesus told us to don't say that the harvest is white, will be white someday, or sometime it will be white. He says, lift up your eyes right now. Get your eyes up. Several things is that is get your eyes off yourself. Lift your eyes up. Get your eyes off your own circumstances. Get your eyes off your own circle and your own problems. The fields are already white of the harvest. Already. Not someday, but they're already white. Here we go. Ready? Go for it. Say not ye, not yet four months, and then cometh the harvest field. I say unto you, lift up your eyes. Timothy 5, 7, casting all your care. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you, for he careth for you. And then let's do, last one, either we'll do, uh, which one's that one? Praise name. Praise name. All right, which 
which is Psalm 113.3. There's a couple of them that say the same thing, but same idea. Ready? Praise the name, praise the name, praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name, praise the name, praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth. sun until the going down of the same. The Lord's name is to be praised. Thank you guys. Amen. Thank you. I appreciate it. And um, it's just our challenge really for you to, um, you know, remember and meditate on God's, God's words. You know, when you are um, in some of these places, uh, there's no electricity and there's no running water and you know and it's very very dark. You're just um, it's dark not just physically but also spiritually. It's very dark. And you know you you, you know I've had to learn. In fact, I was almost going to do it today. I've had to learn to actually try to start. I need to start learning to preach from an iPad or something that has some light. You know, your notes, you can't see your Bible, you can't see anything when you're in these places. And, um, you know, it's just, I have to learn something new. But anyway, uh, it's, it's very interesting learning and, and adapting to whatever environment and whatever situation that you're, you're placed in. Um, you know, you're, you're, it's very uncomfortable at times, but God didn't tell us, you know, God gave us the command to go into all the world and preach the gospel. gave us the command. In fact, um, some of you may know the name Jim Elliott. I like Jim Elliott. He did a great work and a great just setting of a testimony for many others to go. But you know, Jim Elliott said in his some of his writings in his personal diary, he said, you know, we don't need so many times we have people in, in churches just like this. And I was in a youth department too. Well, if I'm called, I'll go. Well, if I'm called, I'll go. There's nowhere, by the way, just so you know, church, there's nowhere in this book that says that you have to be called. You don't have to be called. Because technically we were all commanded. When Jesus ascended and he was going back to heaven, he gave the command not just to 12 disciples or 11 disciples. He gave the command to everybody, all the believers that were there. Man, woman, and child, all the believers were commanded to go to the uttermost parts of the world. They were all commanded. And he didn't say, go if I command you or if you get a calling. He said, go. It was a command. We were commanded to go to the uttermost parts of the world. All of us. Now, whether that's in your village, whether it's in your town, whether that's right here or getting involved with supporting. And I know your church is a church a whole. You support many missionaries, and I'm, that's thrilled. That's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing, and we should. Because the fields are wide unto harvest, but the labors are few. But Jim Elliott said, you don't need a call. We all don't need a call. We need a kick in the pants. We don't need a call. We need a kick. Because, you know, I, and I'm trying to remember who it was, maybe Oswald J. Smith said, you know, God doesn't need to give us a calling when he's already commanded. We've already been commanded. And again, as parents, and, and uh, I think of this often, I'm not even into my message yet, but as dads, you know, if you gave your kids a job to do and you say you need to cut the grass and you need to, you know, milk the cows and work on the farm and you need to do these things, right? You had a, you had a job, you, a job that you were commanded to do. And if you come in the house and dad says, son, you didn't do the job. And you say, well, dad, I'm just waiting for a calling. <laughs> Your dads chuckle. Every time I say this, you chuckle because you're like, huh. First of all, if I said that, 
you know, when I woke up, then, you know, I'd rethink things. But if the dad was calm enough, if he was calm enough, if I would be calm enough as a dad, if my son said that to me, I'd say, son, you need a calling? I mean, I've already told you to do it. You're telling me you need a calling? All right, come here. I'll give you a calling. Well, whatever you want to call it, but I'll give you a calling. You'll feel called by the time we're done, right? I mean, honestly, if, if God already gave us a command to go, why do we as believers in churches, and I, we, I've been as guilty too, well, when was your calling? But when was our calling? It's a command. You don't need some special calling when you've been given a command. Amen? It's amazing. Anyway, that's not my message at all. Take your Bible and go to Ezekiel. But some of you, I figure, won't stay awake long enough for the message, so I'll just give you a real quick something, so at least you've got something there. By the way, church, thank you. Ezekiel chapter number 3, thank you for, um, for just your faithfulness and your love. I appreciate your pastor and family so much, his wife, family. Um, you know, we just... Um, you know, coming back from Sierra Leone and uh, just kind of came back into kind of a bit of a, a fiasco. God knows what he's doing always, but, you know, we just don't get it. And it kind of threw our family a little bit into a just a little bit of a crazy whirlwind. But um, but I do appreciate the your pastor knew, and that's one reason why when we come to visit, I know maybe you thought, man, why, why aren't you giving us an update or why this or why that? But we were just um, taking a couple of weeks to kind of recuperate, pray, and um, kind of heal a little. But uh, anyway, and then we were just down in, uh, uh, thank you for the prayers, by the way. We were just down in Florida and then uh, Georgia, went to a church in Georgia, and then Mississippi, Louisiana. Uh, Tennessee, we were Easter, we were in Tennessee, Memphis, Tennessee, uh, 6,500 miles traveled, um, and God kept us totally safe and just took care of us. Actually, I say 6,500 miles, but we had to, we drove two cars because our whole family didn't fit in one, so really it's 13,000 miles traveled, but uh, really, I mean, keeping both vehicles going well and everything just going smoothly. And then uh, now we're getting ready to leave again, as I said, this Friday. But, but thank you very, very much for your prayers and, and for your love, really. Ezekiel chapter number 3. What time am I supposed to be letting out, Pastor? What time is lunch scheduled for, Mrs. Bell? <laughs> oh, okay. What time, church, do you normally get out? No, don't do that. Is it already passed? No, he goes long. Oh, so I have a lot of cushion? Is that what it is? No. I have some people saying, no, you don't have a lot of cushion. All right, here we go. Ezekiel 3, I want to read just a few verses, not probably uncommon to you, and I'm sure you've maybe seen these or had someone preach on them in the past. But son of man, um, I have made thee a watchman. Unto the house of Israel, therefore, all right, so this command was given to us, right? This is, this is the command, it was restated, I've made you a watchman, therefore. Now, therefore, as this is therefore, these are some of the things that need to be being done because you are a watchman. Hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life, and to save wicked men, uh, and the same wicked men shall die in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. This right here is part of, and I know the, ver the Bible has several different comparable passages just like this, that one day we will give an account, and one day we will 
stand before our God and give an account for how we did at carrying out the command. Some call it the Great Commission, but that is it, the command that he had given to us. Just like we would stand before our earthly father and our father would say, hey, why didn't you mow the grass? Why didn't you take out the trash? Why didn't you do your chores? And we would have to give an account to that earthly father, and then we would have to then face the repercussion of the decision that we made, right? We will one day give an account, and this is a very clear explanation of what we need to be doing and that we need to be warning. Now, did it say, by the way, you know, another, I think it may have been Oswald J. Smith. I like Oswald J. Smith, but he said, uh, you know, God gave us the command to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Amen? And I have people say this oftentimes, and they'll ask my kids this as well. Aren't you ever afraid? Aren't you ever scared? Isn't it unsafe? Isn't it, uh, aren't you ever nervous? Or, or uh, isn't it a crazy, scary place? That, yes, all, all of the above, yes. All of the above, yes. And again, but God hath not given us a spirit of fear. We're not supposed to be relying or being controlled by fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. What's the sound mind? The sound mind is God gave us the command to go, not necessarily to return. He didn't say go and don't worry, you'll come back. No, he said go into all the world. He said go to every creature, to every tongue, to every nation. He didn't say we had to come back. He didn't say we had to be safe. I'm all about trying to be as safe as possible. But he didn't say that we're supposed to be ruled by, well, if it's not safe, I'm not going. Well, if that were the case, then according to some of y'all's stories, we wouldn't even go to Wawa over here. <laughs> Sounds like everyone is in agreement just by your chuckles, right? But you still go to Wawa, right? Oh, maybe not that one. Some of y'all go to that one, I'm sure. Because when that addiction hits, when you need that, that fix, uh, hopefully we're not talking about what's going on in the parking lot, but inside, the coffee and that sort of thing. But, uh, but you know, honestly, we're not commanded to come. We're not promised that we'll have a safe return. We're, promised, we're commanded to go. And here we have the example, verse number 17 here, if you look here, Son of man, or may I say Christian worker or believer? Can I say believer? Will you listen to this heed? Will you take the heed? Through the years I've been motivated by great missionary mottos, as I've already used many, but the supreme task of the church is to the evangelization of the world. Is one motto. Another motto is, the most important work of the church is to evangelize for Jesus Christ. And that is the most important thing. That's what, we're, that's what we're here to do, right? That's what we're still here to do. We're here to evangelize. I've told this to my church years after year after year. You know, there's certain things that God, we can do here on earth, but we'll also be able to do in heaven. Like sing praises. I enjoy singing, like y'all were singing earlier. Sing it, but... Someday we'll have a perfect body, which means a perfect voice. I, I you know, my, when I sing with the family, my kids are always like, yeah, Dad, you can sing with me, but, you know, we'll just mute his mic. It's just, it's just for looks. And that's fine. That's all right. Someday but we'll have that perfect voice, right, that perfect body, and we'll be able to praise and sing praises to God. We'll be able to worship God better in heaven than we worship him here. We'll be able to worship him more godly, more purely in heaven than here. We'll be able to wor sing praises to him better in heaven than we'll ever sing praises to him here. I'm really, let's just be honest, right? When we have that new glorified body, when we, when we have that, er, the sin of our flesh done away with and we're not trying to manipulate and we're trying to get you know, what we want and you know, those selfish things that we have, We'll be able to do things so much, but there's one thing in heaven that we will not be able to do better, and that's witness. You won't be able to tell another lost soul about Christ. You won't be a better 
witness for Christ in heaven. Here's the only place that you can be a witness for him. Because once we go to heaven, it's done. Our, that, that, that chapter's over. We can't witness to you anymore unsaved people. I want to I challenge you. I'm going to give you three words here that we're going to go over just on this motto. The world. Just the world. The supreme task of the church is to evangelize the world. When God loved the world, he died. You all know John 3.16. If you don't know a lot of scripture by memory, you probably know John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? He gave his son to the world. Not just to America. He gave his son to the world. To all the world. That all might be saved. He said, I come to seek and to save the lost. Well, there's lost all over the world. You know, it breaks my heart when we go into these places. I'm sorry, I try to control, but... <clears throat> It breaks my heart when we go into these places and these villages and you talk to them and you want to tell them about Jesus Christ and people oftentimes will ask, well, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? You know, you all were just singing songs and I loved singing the songs, the greatest, the sweetest name we know, but they don't even know the name of Jesus. We sing songs like I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory. And it is. It's such an old story that most of the people and most of the young people in this room are like, oh, boy, that's the same thing I'm hearing all the time. But it's not an old, old story to them. In fact, to many of the villages and many of the places, it's a brand new, never heard before story. They've never heard of Jesus. And when you say Jesus came and he died for you and God sent his son, Jesus, to die for you, they'll say he did for, for me? Why, why would he die for me? No joke, folks. People, don't, they just, they've not grasped it. They've not heard it over and over again. You saw in some of the photos, we go into the villages and we'll show a film, a film kind of on, on the life of Jesus. And we show them, but you know, when somebody, when, when Jesus takes the five loaves and the two fishes, and we've heard this hundreds of times, this story, right? But when Jesus takes those five loaves and those two fishes and he holds them up in the film, now stop for a minute and grasp the fact that these people, oftentimes, many of them are starving no joke, starving to death. Okay, so when you see bloated children on National Geographic and you see these children with their stomachs all bloated out and things and you think, oh, they're starving to death. And, you know, most of us in this room don't even quite understand why they're bloated and their belly buttons are pushing out and all of that. I didn't quite understand it either, but it's really, they won't even say they're starving to death. They'll say, oh, no, 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 they've eaten today. They've eat, they eat every day. But what they do is they only get to eat, it would be like us eating, uh, well, they eat Gary, which would be like, it's cassava, ground cassava. The best way I can explain it is it's like dried grits, not cooked, dried grits, and you, they just pick it up and they'll eat it just like that. No moisture, sometimes they'll mix water in it or whatever, but dried, and that's what they eat. So it would be like eating um, uh, starch two to three times a day, and not ever getting protein. I'm talking never. One of our national pastors, the one church, I said, Pastor Solomon, growing up, he ate Gary two times a day for seven years growing up. That's all he ever got. Never did he ever get any type of protein at all. So if you're eating nothing but starch, that just blows your stomach up. You're not getting the nutrition your body really needs. So it looks like they're, um, so that's why, by the way, they get the bloated stomach. It's because of that, the, so much starch in their stomach. But anyway, but when you go into these places and you see these villages and you see them, and when Jesus is lifting the five loaves and two fishes up, and he's praying and he asks God to bless it, and he brings it down, and it's multiplied, and they feed 5,000 men plus women and children, 
You know, they don't just sit there like we're sitting here today saying, yeah, I know. I've heard that story like a thousand times in Sunday school. They don't sit there like that. They literally, no joke, they break out in cheers. If this was the crowd, they'd all start, ah! and they'd, they'd be jabbering back and forth just in enamored because they've never even heard the story before. He just multiplied. Did you see him multiply that food? Probably in their minds are thinking, man, I wish he'd do that here today. When they nailed Jesus to the cross, uh, no joke, when we're showing the video and, and they take Jesus to Pilate, and Pilate says, do you want Barabbas or Jesus? And they say, give us Barabbas. And the people that have never heard of Jesus before, never observed it, they don't know the story, and they've never seen the end get so angry and mad they'll holler out that's not fair that's injustice no Jesus is the innocent one no 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 they'll get so upset sometimes they'll turn and they'll you know like when you watch a bad movie and say this is stupid I'm not even going to finish it they'll turn and walk away and we have to stop them and say hold on stop hold, hold on watch the end please stay and watch the end this is a stupid movie. This is dumb. This doesn't make sense. No, you have to watch the end. No joke. We just recently had people, and when, when, when you don't grasp the concept of you know, video and projection and watching movies and that this is just on a screen, it's not really happening. We just had some people, I may have told your pastor already, did I tell you, Congo, they asked me if I could bring a new screen the next time I come because they were showing the video and as Jesus was being crucified, they were still so upset. They hadn't seen the end where he raises up, right? But they're so upset with the fact that Jesus is being unjustly crucified by these soldiers that some of the warrior archers standing near the back shot arrows through the screen to kill the soldiers. You say, how do they not understand that that's not real? Because to them, it's not an old, old story. To them, this is a just, honest man that is being treated unfairly. And when you get into these villages and these places and you realize nobody has one time ever told them about Jesus. It blows your mind. It blows your mind. It makes me feel as I have come back year after year and I think, my goodness, we've got to get to those places that Jesus said are white unto harvest. And that's why, like, I forget, my wife gave me the stats. It's on my phone and I was trying to remember it. Aaron, it's on my phone right there, the email. Can you read it? The text message for just read the text message. Just read it out loud so that you can read it. Can you read it? No? I'm just going to have you read it. The text message from mom. Read the stats just so they can rejoice with us. Just this past time coming back from Sierra Leone, how many villages? Oftentimes in those schools, and that they are very conservative, by the way. I personally think the numbers are higher than that with salvations, but we try to be way on the conservative side. Let God do the numbers. I don't want people to think we're making things up. But it's honestly, the fields are white unto harvest, but the labors are few. The world, Jesus died. God died, gave his son for the world. When he gave his son, he gave his son for the world. When Jesus died, he died for the world. God's vision is not just a localized vision, it's a world vision. He wants us also to have a world vision. There are those who only think of the church, their church, their place. And again, 
I'm glad you, you you're, uh, trust you're a faithful member of your church. But, you know, some people only think, I've had church members come to me before over the years and say, Pastor, I don't think we should be given to missions. We need to worry about our church. We need to worry about our country. We need to worry about our. And I, you know what I said to them? I said, oh, no. I said, oh, no. That's not what Jesus' plan was. He said, well, we need to make sure everybody's saved in our country before we worry about going to another country. I said, no, 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 no. If that were the case, we in America wouldn't even still have the gospel today. Because where was the gospel spread out from? Jerusalem. Are they all Christians in Jerusalem? No, we know they're not. So if they would have waited till all of Jerusalem was reached, we'd still be dying and going to hell here. Amen? we got to stop and think about this for a minute before we say things out loud. But honestly, we're not going to see them all saved. And by the way, Jesus didn't even see everyone that he preached to come to him and believe him. Many of them followed. The Bible says many of them followed, but many of them followed just to see the wonders that he did. They didn't really believe. But if they didn't all believe even Jesus, what makes us think every single person we talk to is going to believe? The command isn't that we have to force people to believe in Jesus. The command is to preach the gospel. Just give the facts. If they choose to accept, then okay. But if they choose to reject, now they can't point a finger back at us, right? The command is to preach and give the gospel. That's the same thing Jesus did while he was going from village to village and place to place. Then there are those. There are those that say, well, you know, Asia needs to be reached or oh, Europe needs to be reached or Africa or North America or South America or wherever. This has to be reached before we go anywhere else. No, we need to be doing. In fact, Acts chapter 1 says to go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, both. It says both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost. That word both means we need to be doing it all at the same time, not just one at a time. All at the same time. God's vision is a world vision. Many of us here are, are uh, nearsighted in our vision. We only look locally rather than globally. You know, it's kind of like when most of you probably have ever gotten on an airplane. You get on an airplane. You get on the airplane if you're maybe fortunate enough, if you like a window seat. Some people don't like the window seat. They're like, I don't want to see outside. I don't want to see the fact the ground's getting further away. Well, it is. Whether you see it or not, it is, okay? I mean, that's a good thing when you're flying. You want the ground to get further away, not too close. Uh, but anyway, but, you know, some people, you know, they get on the plane and they, you know, you, but you get on the plane and you see just, I mean, you see like hardly nothing, right? That little teeny window. And you see like you're trying to look and you're trying to see what they're loading into the bottom of the plane, you know, and you're trying to look up that direction. You can't see very much. You see mainly concrete, just about that's about it, right? A few vehicles here and there, whatever. You don't get to see much. In fact, the further away from the window you are, if you're on the aisle seat, you're, you really don't get to see much, right? But... You get to see just a little, but then as you start taxiing and maybe you get to see a little more, you start leaving the ground, then you start to see the city or the whole airport maybe. Then you get, the higher up you get, the more you get to see, right? And before long, sometimes you get way up if you have good clear with no cloud cover. Boy, you could just see for just dozens and dozens and dozens of miles, right? You see islands out in the ocean, you can see... God, it's just amazing. But you just got to get further away. Jesus said to lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes. Don't just look at what's happening locally. Yes, get involved. Yes, get involved in VBS, chompers and stompers. That sounds like a killer. That sounds awesome. But get involved with your local, your, 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 your church activities and what's going on. And be, be supportive and, and serve and work and be a part of soul wedding and bus route or Sunday school visitation or whatever it is that, you, that, that your church has going. But be involved. But realize that there is a much bigger vision, too, that God has. He's got a world vision. If God is interested in... Uh, in world vision, that we too need to be interested in world vision. God, from his vantage point, can look down and see all countries, all continents, all islands, all at once. We must try to see the world as Jesus sees it. 
I know it's hard because oftentimes, you know, we just, we can't grasp it because we're human and we just don't grasp everything that God has, that God knows and God has seen. But studying some geography would help. Seriously. Talk to those who have done some traveling. Seriously. Um, you all have the benefit of being out here near the base and military men coming and going and ladies that have traveled a lot of the world. We were a little further there in Willingboro, but thankfully we had lots of military people coming and going. And I, what a blessing it was to be able to talk with them and chat with them and, and, and discuss with them. The, uh, military guys in this room, you, you'll know this, or, or ladies as well, but uh, some of the military guys would tell our missionaries when they would travel through, wow, we, we're praying for you more. Our military guys, often, and several of them, I can think of several that were in Baghdad in various areas, but they said, you know, we go over to these areas, but we have a lot of buddies with us. We have weapons to protect one another. Missionaries are going into these fields with nothing. They're going into these fields without that large army that's supporting them. And so be in prayer for your missionaries that are coming and going in the various different places. But everyone thinks that they are uh, the people or they're the supreme, they're the ones. And that brings me to the second word, supreme. If world evangelism is our most important work, then when a missions conference or a missions gathering or your pastor does something for evangelization, what should be the most important thing in our mind? What should be the most important thing in our schedules? If world evangelism is the supreme task of the church, then what should be the most supreme thing for us to attend? Right? It's just a fact, because that's the supreme task of the church, is evangelization of the world. That's what God told us to do. Matthew chapter number 6 and verse number 33, you all know it, but seek ye first. Seek ye first what? His kingdom. Not seek my kingdom first. Not seek my desires first, my hopes, my dreams, my wants. Young people, seniors, juniors, the most commonly asked question, well, what do you think? What are you going to do? What do you want to do? Seek his kingdom first. You know, that's another thing that saddens me immensely. I go back into these village places. Senior, I don't know who I'm talking to, maybe college student. I go, I go back into these village places. You can ask my kids. They've been there. If if you see a missionary person in most of these third world environment places, if you see another missionary, usually it's the telltale sign that it's not the same nationality as where you are, right? It's not always from America, by the way, sometimes different European countries or whatever. But um, if you see someone, I walk up and I say, what are you doing way back in this jungle? I never thought I'd ever see another person that would speak English. What are you doing here? And they look at me kind of the same way. What are you doing here? And we say, well, man, I'm, you know, we're here on mission work. What are you doing here? Well, I'm with the Peace Corps. Or we're Jehovah's Witness. Or we're Mormon. And we're given our two years of a tithe that God has given to me. God's given me 18 years or 20 years. I'm giving him two years of my life to do mission work. And they're willing to go to all kinds of places. The Peace Corps. I've yet to meet, well, maybe the one, one Peace Corps person that was saved. All the rest of them, not even saved. One man was a 70-some-year-old, 72-year-old, retired military Air Force, but when you join the Peace Corps, you have to sign a paper saying, I will not use any of my funds. I will not use my retirement. I will use any money. They live on just exactly the same amount of money that a national will live on, a dollar to a dollar fifty a week. But they sign a commitment saying, I'll live just like the nationals. Unsaved. I've only met one Peace Corps person that was possibly a Christian. All the rest unsafe, but they're willing to go and put themselves in that environment, live that way for years. And I say, why are you doing this? 
if they're not telling people about Jesus and they're not telling people how to go to heaven, why are you doing this? It's just a good question for me. You know what they say? Just so that I can make the world a better place before I die. Now, Christian, let me ask you, church, don't we have a better message to preach than that? Now, I want to say that, yes, we do. That's what I want to say. I want to say, yes, we do. But then where are they? If we have such a wonderful message and we have the greatest story ever told and we have the gift of God through eternal life, we have all of that to tell people, then how come those people that have it aren't telling it? Isn't it sad? You see the quandary that it, it, it's, it's strange. And it's very discouraging at times to see that we're not preaching and teaching the gospel to the world as we've been commanded to. But the supreme task, Dr. Oswald J. Smith said the uh, first church uh, uh, in his church, his first church service, he went to Canada, he pastored in Canada, if you know much about him, went to Canada, pastored his first church service. After the service, the deacons and the men of the church came to him and said, Pastor, before, you, uh, before we voted you in as our pastor, we didn't want to tell you this. So we didn't, but our church is just direly, horribly in debt. But we didn't want to tell you because we thought you wouldn't take it. Probably a good idea for him to not to tell him. He said, that's fine. He said, no, 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 pastor, we've got creditors coming down our back. We've got all kinds of people trying to get us. I mean, we've got old big problems. He said, okay. So within the first month, he started a missions conference. He told the deacons, he told the church, he said, we're going to have a missions conference. They said, a what? We just said we're in debt. He said, that's all right. We're going to focus on God's world, the command that God gave us. And he began to tell his people, he kept saying to his people, if you focus on God's big world, God will take care of your little world. And so he started missions emphasis in a church that was in debt as a brand new pastor. And one year passes. Within the first year, almost this into the second year, their church was completely out of debt. And their missions had like quadrupled. By the time that first year and pretty close to the end of that, he ends up telling his church, he said, the day our church ever keeps more money in our church than we give to world missions is the day you get my resignation. But from that point on, every year, their church did nothing but just missions, 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 emphasis, and constantly doing their best to reach the world. Because he said, this is the supreme task of God, of the church. It's our job to do what God has commanded us to do. Every man, every woman, every young adult. You know what, sadly, oftentimes what happens in most churches, I don't, I'm not seeing here, what most churches, you say, Who's, you know, who, who heads up the missions program? Usually it's, well, it's the Women's Missionary Society. It's a small group of ladies, not belittling that. I'm not belittling that if that's the case here. But it's a small group of ladies that handle the missions kind of emphasis. But, you know, that's not the way that our churches should be run. Our churches, if it's God's supreme task to reach the world, then it ought to be a whole church's task. I mean, it ought to be, yes, the women's groups, but not just the women's groups. It ought to be the men's groups that are focused on our missions, too. And it ought to be the junior church's missions to fo fo or, uh, emphasis to focus on missions. And the kids' emphasis to focus on me. everybody, because it's the supreme task of the church is to tell the world of Jesus Christ. And if it was everyone's task... And by the way, there are some great churches. There are some great places, just like your church, with some great things. We've been able to see some neat things. A junior church class in, uh, actually out west uh, contributed right now on about a weekly basis on the work that that junior church, that offering that that junior church took up for their national pastor, they're seeing uh, very conservatively, I'm going to say 40 to 50 souls come to Christ a week. From a junior church. From a junior church. Amen. Amen. And that's if everyone would get focused on this. If everyone would realize that supreme task. We'd see our, 
uh, we'd be able to reach the, the, the uh, command that God gave to us, even so much so. When you put first things first, God works. Did you hear me? Hear that statement? Put first things first, God will work. Put first things first, God will work. And if, there, if there's businessmen in here, let me just sit a half a second on this or a couple minutes maybe. Listen, businessmen, I'd like to challenge you. Put first things first. Put first things first. I can, I can, I can, I, I can testify to you. Calvary Bible Baptist Church was over right about $18,000 in the hole when I became the pastor. In debt. The building was falling apart. The windows, the roof was leaking, you name it. It was falling apart. The furnace needed replaced. I mean, you, you go down the list. If it was a big money ticket item, it needed it. The nursery was a mess. Everything was a wreck. $18,000 in the hole. But then you continue to put first things first. Continue to do what God told you to do. And I'm telling you, and I, I can tell you right now, two businessmen. And no, no one was rich in that church. I had no rich people in the church, never. And I, I loved it because then that just means everybody has to do a part. Because if you have one rich person, then they think, ah, they'll do it. No, we don't need any one person. We need everybody to do their part. But we, I'm telling you, two businessmen, one businessman said, you know, I'm going to start giving 10%, not just 10% to offerings. I'm going to give another 10%, make it 20% of my income for my business to missions. Then he made it from 10% to 18%. Then he made it to 20%. I have another businessman, they quadrupled their businesses because of them putting first things first. God bless their businesses. God bless their businesses. Because they put first things first. They put first things first. Listen, I want to encourage you. Amen? Please get this. Understand this. Ladies, get this. Lastly, the church. The supreme task of the church is evangelization. Church. Church. We are the church. You are the church. The supreme task of the church. Not, oh, yeah, the supreme task. No, no. You are the church. The two middle letters in church is you are, right? You are the church. It's you. Are you, are you doing what God wants you to do? But when God speaks to the church, he thinks the whole church. Every man, every woman, everyone. I'm going to end with this. There's a legend told concerning the return of Jesus in heaven. Meeting Gabriel. Jesus ascends. It's a legend, okay? I'm just... Reminding you, there's a legend that when Jesus went back to heaven, he ascended, left earth. He commanded as he was ascending, he says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, right, to every creature. And then when he gets back to heaven, Gabriel says, good job, Jesus. Good job. Man, you did good. Man, we were ready to come, get you off the cross. All you needed to do was call. But you didn't, but that's okay. But you did good. You did good. And the angels are gathered around. They're cheering them on. Jesus, you did good. Now, Gabriel says, now, you died. You went through all of that. You shed your blood. Now, whose job is it? What, what, what plan do you have to get the gospel to the whole rest of the world? And Jesus said, well, this is what I did. I left a small band of men and believers, and I gave them the command to go into all the world and preach the gospel and to tell everybody about this free gift. And Gabriel said, okay, and what organization, what big, what, what big way are you going to use to really get the gospel out? And he said, no, I left this small band of believers and these people that have trusted me, and I've told them to take the gospel. And Gabriel just kind of blank stares at Jesus and says, okay, so if plan A doesn't work, then what? What's plan B? And Jesus looks back at Gabriel and says, I have no plan B. My plan and Christ's plan to get the gospel to all the world was the believers. It was us. He said, my plan to get the gospel to all the world is that they would go and share it. 
but that they would go and tell. And one day, there will be millions upon millions of heathen lost without Christ that will march in front of the Savior and in front of us and they'll be cast into outer darkness forever and forever. And one day, when they, as they're passing, I believe without, without any doubt, even me, that there's going to be many a hands and there's going to be many a fingers pointed at me saying, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you come? Why didn't you come to my village? Why didn't you come to my, why didn't you send anybody? You pastored for how many years? How come you didn't send anybody? You know, it's going to be a sad day. Because Christ did tell us to go to every creature. But when we go into a village and we say, we'd like to tell you about Jesus. And the chief says, who's Jesus? Someone's failed. We failed. I failed. And we need to be better at the Father's business. Amen? I do thank you, church, for your investment. I thank you for all that you have done. I ask you to continue to pray. Because, you know, it is Christ's prayer request that we pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he send forth more laborers. And I want to ask you to at least be praying. You may not be able to go, but you could pray. Some of you maybe could go. Some of you young people maybe could go. You know, my son, just we just got an announcement. Maybe that some of you here now. One, there's a missionary in Thailand right now. He just got all of the public schools opened up to him. He can preach in all public schools. He says there's one million. That's one million students. He said, I just can't get into them all. I need somebody that's willing to come, some college-age men, some people that could just, all they need to be able to do is give the gospel. Maybe you could do something like that. He said maybe a month, maybe two months. But I need people willing to get into the schools to preach. I don't know who it is in this room, but I can't help but to believe that in all of our churches across America, there has to be, there definitely has to be more people that God is calling or has commanded and we're just not obeying the command. Amen? I mean, we need to. Our time is short. Everyone in this room feels, and we know Christ could return at any moment. What are we doing? What are we doing? If you don't know Christ as your Savior, hey, I want to tell you, you need to trust Christ as your Savior too. This message is for you. You say, well, I've heard it before. Well, have you accepted it? Have you accepted it? It's one thing to be a hearer and not a doer. Have you accepted it? Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Do you know where you're going to spend eternity when you die? Father, I pray that you'd bless. I pray that you'd be with each one here. I don't know all the faces here. I don't know who's a very first-time visitor or return visitor or someone that's maybe been struggling with their eternal security. Lord, I pray that you'd be with each one here. I thank you, Lord, for this church, the pastors, family, the, the church, and their emphasis on missions already. But, Lord, I pray that you would help us to just do more. We know we're not, still not reaching the world. We know there's still so many places still yet to even hear your name. Lord, I pray. Maybe there's a young person in this room that would be willing to go. Maybe on a, maybe only a two-week trip. Maybe a month. Maybe six months. But Lord, if there's someone in this room, please don't, don't let them be at peace just sitting still. Work in their heart, Lord. Help them to obey the command. We love you, Heavenly Father, and we need you, and we thank you for all you do. In your name we pray.
with heads bowed and eyes closed, if there's anyone here today.